Shalom everyone and welcome back to Reboot the Root. I've, I'm so glad that you joined me here again as we start another exciting series about a biblical topic that I think that we are missing in mainstream Christianity. It's one of those subjects that, that we in Hebrew Roots or those of us who are Messianic or Torah Keepers are known for and that is the dietary laws. And so that's what we're going to be talking about in this series of Reboot the Root. So before we go any further into this new series, I want to remind you that this is Reboot the Root, where we're on a journey back to truth. We're re-examining what our doctrines are against biblical truths. So if you have uh, concepts and doctrines in in your belief system that cannot be supported by scripture then you need to get rid of them because those things that remain they are man-made and they are the doctrines of men so here reboot the root I'm here to teach you about um, subjects that are think are very important for us as disciples of of Yahweh disciples of the Bible disciples of correct biblical theology things that we need to be mindful of. So uh, this is Reboot the Root where we are um, testing everything and we are, we are re-examining our belief system against scripture. So uh, before, before we move on I want to uh, put a thought in your head, it's a biblical concept that we should be testing everything that someone teaches us including myself. If I teach you something that's unbiblical then you should test it. Test, test the Word of God and prove it. And if it doesn't pass that test of Scripture, then it should be removed. So, <clears throat> thank you for joining me and coming back for this series about the dietary laws. And this series is called Good for Food. Good for Food. And so, like I said before, we are going to be talking about the dietary laws and so other words that may describe this is eating kosher. Now when we understand kosher that usually has a Judaism backdrop and so things that are kosher in Judaism doesn't necessarily match up with biblical dietary laws. Some things have been added in Judaism that is not found in scripture so that goes with what I was sharing with you about that we need to stick to a sola scriptura scripture only idea so kosher and eating biblically is two different things and we'll be looking at that as we go through the series so this is episode one of good for food so um, before we get too much further I want to suggest to you to question the answers. Question the answers. We need to get back to our Hebraic roots to read, learn biblical truths. In other words, if you think you have the answers or you're listening to a teacher who thinks they have the answers, you need to question those answers. Get your own answers. Get out your Bible. Study the Word of God and find out the truth. There's nothing wrong with watching YouTube or um, other other uh, platform based teachers online but we we should also be bringing out our Bible to see if what they're teaching us is true that's the great thing about knowing the Word of God before you actually listen to someone you can know if someone's teaching you wrong um, so some of the things that we like to talk about or I like to talk about rather in reboot the root is challenging the common accepted mandated doctrines that conflict biblical truth. I like, to, I like to encourage those, maybe you, who desire to have the truth to checklist your theology and prove it with scripture, which I've already talked about here. Uh, I, want, I want to make sure that we're returning back to the original path of being Christ or Messiah-like. We also want to explore the ancient paths of the Netzarim and, and how did they follow um, after the Messiah. So the Netzarim were people who were Torah keepers but they also 
uh, followed after, the, after Yeshua as the Messiah. Uh, here on Reboot the Root, I'm teaching the way of the apostles about the Hebraic root, and I'm teaching about us uh, how do we return back to being a Hebraic Messianic believer. And so those are the things that we're covering um, in these series, and it, and it is also what we'll be teaching in this series of Good for Food. So we need to take a look at Hebrews 4.12 that talks about for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And we need to ask ourselves the question, perhaps we need to have a reboot of truth. As it says in 2 Timothy 2.15 will tell us how do we have this reboot. It says study, did you hear that word? Study to show yourself approved unto Yah a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So you need to have the spirit of truth within you. So whenever you're, you're hearing people teach, we need to have the word of God and we need to have the Holy Spirit that will teach us what is true and what is not untrue. So we have to study and we have to divide the word of truth. And we, we, when we have these things, we will be able to have our hearts and our minds open to concepts that go against what we have been taught in mainstream religion. And so a lot of these things that we're teaching in these series, or I'm teaching rather, will be very strange to mainstream religion. And actually it goes against what a lot that they teach. So anyway, this is Reboot the Root, and this is what we're doing with these teachings. And um, I'm so glad that you've joined me uh, for this first episode of the new series called Good for Food. So let's talk a little about a little bit of our introduction into the series of Good for Food. Most Christians enjoy the freedom of liberty in what they consume as what is considered food. There are many people out there who have a wrong definition of what food is. And we're not necessarily just talking about things that are called quote unquote unkosher, but we're also talking about things of, that we consume on our bodies that are bad for us to eat. And we'll be talking about that later. So we need to be concerned about what goes into our bodies. There is an enjoyment of foods that were once prohibited by the Bible, but some feel that we are now set free by the spirit of liberty. So the spirit of liberty never goes against the word of God to teach us a way to be lawless. In other words, a way that goes against God's instructions, what he's told us to do. That's not the spirit of liberty. The modern day misunderstanding of New Testament scriptures without a Old Testament key fails to unlock God's laws regar regarding what is good for food. So what I'm trying to say here is if you don't know what, what the Old Testament teaches, then you can't fully comprehend what is being taught to you in the New Testament. Many people like to stay in the New Testament side of the pool without first going into the Old Testament side of the pool. So you have to read the first part of the book to really understand correctly what the latter part of the book is saying. So we have this opening verse in Jeremiah 17, 23 that I'd like us to read. And if you have your Bibles, uh, take out your Bibles and read along with me. It's in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 23. And I'll put that verse on the screen. But they obeyed not, neither inclined the ear, but made their necks stiff, that they may not hear nor receive instruction. So this is the stubbornness of the heart of man, especially in these days that we lived in. Because this verse, at verse aptly describes the mind of the lawless person. The person who says, I can eat whatever I want without any kind of responsibility or consequences. So Jeremiah 17 verse 23 describes those type of people. These people, they were disobedient. They didn't want to hear anything. 
they were stiff-necked, they were stubborn, and they weren't interested in hearing anything nor receiving any kind of instruction. So to that type of person is unteachable. Someone who does not want to change their ways, but rather be a person who likes what they've been taught, how they lived, and they're not willing to change. So for us to really get the truth of God's word in our lives, we're going to have to be able to hear God's word. We're going to have to learn to be obedient. We're going to have to be flexible and we're going to have to have an open heart and have an open mind and be willing to hear and be willing to receive instructions. So R.C. Sproul says this interesting comment to the challenge of the status quo. He says, when there's something in the Word of God I don't like, the problem is not with the Word of God, it's with me. So how many of us uh, will pick a Jesus way of studying Scripture, which means we want the Bible to support what we believe? I think the majority of us, if we were truthful, will say we have an Jesus type of study um, um, discipline. But we need to have an exegesis form of study which says that we're going to let the Word of God change us. In other words, it goes back to the last verse in Jeremiah that we would receive instruction. So the, the, the eisegesis person will not receive instruction, but the exegesis person will receive instruction. And those are the people who are changed and they have, um, they have the truth of God within them. So this question comes up, um, can believers eat all things that leads me to do this series? Because there, there are people out there that think that Jesus came to free us from his law when he died on the cross. And that is not true. That's not true at all. Jesus came to die for sinners, to die for their transgressions, their infractions, but he did not come to remove his law. So here's some of the things I want to uh, make note of, of, of how people who do not have ears to hear may think. They think that Christians are allowed to eat meat because Jesus made all things clean and gives us freedom, and that is not true. After Jesus came, they believe that, that he died for our sins and rose again, fulfilling the law in the Old Testament. And we would read in the book of Matthew, we find that that is not true. Yeshua tells us that he did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Okay, so that's very clear that Jesus did not come to fulfill the law in the Old Testament. Um, now, and some people believe in their theology, now that we are made clean through the crucifixion of Jesus, we no longer have to worry about being made unclean by meat. And that is um, not true. God's standard is the same all the way from creation until now. I believe that God's law was there at the beginning of creation, not just at Mount Sinai. And so God has this standard of how we are to live and to walk before him. Uh, they also seem to think that we are able to eat meat because Jesus has freed us from the obligation to obey the law. And that is not true. We get to do God's law. It's not a have to. And so there is no idea that we get to be freed from um, keeping God's law or the dietary laws. They, people who think like this act as if it's quite a burden to carry to only eat what God has instructed. And so this, this little table of things about how about can believers eat all things comes from JustDisciple.com. And JustDisciple.com also says Jesus didn't say he was throwing throwing away the law, he said he fulfilled it. And so we have gone through this before about what it means to fulfill. Fulfill means to um, bring in, into being, to bring into fullness, to make, um, 
to make um, complete. Uh, he came to teach us his law. Um, but we'll talk about that more in a little bit. Um, JustDisciple.com goes on to say, as a Christian today, you can know that God allows us to eat meat. There's nothing sinful or unclean about it. According to the New Testament, you have the freedom to choose whether or not you will eat meat without worrying about the laws from the Old Testament. So, um, these are things that people tend to think um, in their doctrine is that they have some kind of a justification by the twisting of scripture um, to be able to uh, validate their eating of unclean meats and unclean things. So let's look at the perspective of this idea that people think that, that Jesus came to do away with his law, thus we're allowed to eat anything we want. So let's take a look at where the scripture comes from. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 19, and it reads, Think not I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle, in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever there shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, he, the same shall be called in the kingdom of heaven. So we have a, a few things going on here. First of all, we see that Yeshua says he didn't come to destroy the law, but he came to fulfill. The second thing is, he says, until heaven and earth pass, not one little bit of the law will go away until all has been fulfilled. And the third aspect here is that whosoever shall break just the least commandments and also teach other people to do this, they will be considered the least in the kingdom of heaven. How many pastors and Bible teachers have you heard that teach you not to do the commandments of God? There are tons of them, lots of them, because that is what they, are, they have been taught in their denomination or taught in their seminaries or they've been taught in their um, misunderstanding of Scripture. So let's talk about now the fulfill perspective, which talks about what is this thing about fulfilling, okay, the law. Uh, Carmen Imes says, Jesus does not do away with the Old Testament law. He calls people back to it and holds them to it. David Wilbur says, the Messiah fully embodies the Torah in his life and teachings. In Getty Resource Center writes, to fulfill is called lekayim, which means to uphold or establish. I really like that definition. To, to fulfill means to uphold the Torah and to establish the Torah. And finally, David Biven, uh, he says, fulfill the law is often used as an idiom. An idiom is a thing, it's a saying, kind of like a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, like that. Uh, fulfill the law is often used as an idiom to mean to properly interpret the Torah so that people can obey it as God really intends. And I like that, that definition too about what it means to fulfill. Uh, continuing in the fulfill perspective, when Yeshua says he doesn't come to destroy the law, he is essentially disposing of any ideas that his teachings are anti-Torah. So that may have been when he's giving his message on the Mount of Olives. There may be those who think that he's going to bring an anti-Torah message and he's saying, no, I haven't come to destroy the law. I have come to fulfill it. Yeshua, in discipling his followers, is teaching them that he will be reinforcing the adherence to the Mount Sinai instructions of how to live. So Yeshua is, has come to the earth. God in the form of Yeshua is coming to the earth to reinforce the importance of the Torah. He, he, um, he, is, he is not only um, God on earth, he is, he is Yeshua in the flesh. He is the Messiah in the flesh. 
He is the prophet. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior. And so as all those roles, he is going to be here to reinforce the Torah among uh, the disciples and the people who would be changed by his teachings. Fulfilling of the law is correctly understood as making the law more full in expression of its in intent and original meaning. That's a good one too. There's a, there's, let's read a little bit of that part, uh, highlight this part. It says, an expression of its intent and original meaning. That's what it is to fulfill. The fullness of the law was not completed until the revival of Yahshua. Uh, continuing on in the fulfilled perspective, Yahshua taught us that the law is expressed fully with love as the lens that we look through at the law of God. So if you are, if you are looking at the law through the lens of love, then you will understand the Torah, the instructions, the law of God more clearly if you look at it through the lens of love. Romans 13.10 backs up this statement saying love is the fulfilling of the law. So if you are not loving God and loving your neighbor but yet you feel like you're doing the commandments then you really aren't keeping the commandments because keeping God's commandments will produce love as the reason of why you do them. Consider the contextual elements of Matthew 5 where law breaking is prohibited teaching others to be lawless is penalized and not even the smallest part of the law will disappear until all is fulfilled these are the elements of Matthew chapter 5 on the Sermon on the Mount when he is addressing uh, the importance of keeping the Torah Jesus's purpose was to establish the word to embody it and to fully accomplish all that was written and that comes from gotquestions.org Romans 10.4 says, For Christ is the end, and if we really understand this verse, we don't see end as completion, but we see end as meaning as a purpose. So, for Christ is the purpose of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So, what sense would this make if we said, For Christ is the completion of the law for righteousness? righteousness. I thought the whole purpose was for us to get on the road to righteousness. So why would we want it, the righteousness to end? We wouldn't want it to end. But we want, we, in order for us to have the righteousness, we need to understand that the, um, the whole purpose of God's Torah is to lead us to Messiah. The Sermon on the Mount is a mission statement of Yeshua stating why he has come and not to confuse his visit as a challenge to the Mosaic Law. There are many out there who have this thought called God Knows My Heart. And Pastor Andy Stanley, um, he says, In error, Jesus did not abolish the law when he fulfilled it, but in fulfilling it, listen to this, he made it obsolete. How many times have you heard a pastor or Bible teacher say this, that God's law is obsolete? Uh, many Christians will work hard to defend their loose freedom to eat whatever they want with no conscience and no responsibility. The law doesn't apply to me, says a lot of people, because they say I'm not Jewish. They think that there are Jewish laws and then there are Gentile laws. And so we need to understand that the whole book was written, written for Israel. And if you have been born again, you are considered grafted in to Israel. Uh, so when they say this law doesn't apply to me, they start looking at this thing called the doctrines of ceremonial and moral laws. They start dividing up like as if it's biblical, like there's some place in the Bible that says that there's a separation of ceremonial and moral laws, uh, thus supporting why they don't have to keep these things. There's nowhere in the scriptures that say this, that there is a division of laws that you don't have to keep anymore. And then there are these laws over here that you do keep. It doesn't say that anywhere in scripture. So this whole thing that supports uh, or validates people to be loose cannons and keeping the law is the statement, God knows my heart. But God does know your heart. That's the eye-opening statement.
So do we value our doctrinal statements so much that we value less of God's law? Um, so uh, we, the, I got this title for this series from the statement in Genesis 3.6 that says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. What seemed good to Eve was in fact not good. And so man today eats what he wants and calls it good for food, but it really is not good, it's not, it's not food for him. So you notice in my inflections, I highlighted or made inflections toward key words. Good, good for food. The woman thought that what she was tempted with was good. It was good for her. But, the, but Yahweh had already said this was not permissible for her. This would not, this is not for her. And then the next thing is that I inflected that it was a tree to be desired. Um, so when we, when we tend to eat things that we want and we try to validate scripture with, it's out of a heart that out of what we want, what we desire, and to make one wise. So in a man's own wisdom, he has decided what is good for him, no matter what the Bible says. And so we need to go back to the scripture and we need to find out what does God say that is um, good for food. So in her quest, or not a quest, but in her mistake of finding out what was good for her to eat. What the woman thought was food was in fact not food at all. And that's like today that our society seems to deem what is food is actually not food. Some of the things that people eat, um, they're what, they were never designed for food. They were designed for uh, waste disposal, like pigs and scavenger birds um, or sea creatures, shellfish in the ocean. All of these creatures they were designed as scavengers to be able to uh, process the waste of the earth, basically garbage cans. So um, in the garden, the tree served a purpose, but its purpose was not food. Just like there are things I just told you, there are things that God creates that was not meant for food, but it had a different purpose. The purpose that this tree, the garden, served as was a test to see whether man would obey or disobey. God created all of creation to serve a purpose, but not all the purposes were the same. Um, the forbidden fruit is compared to the dietary laws. Both are prohibited through obedience. In other words, we are not, pro we are not permitted to eat certain things because it is forbidden to us, just much like it was in the Garden of Eden. There is a reason why God does not want us to eat certain things. A lot of times it's for health reasons, that it will lessen our, our lifespan, or it will cause diseases, or it will cause um, uh, toxicity to be in our bodies. There are many, many reasons why these creatures we eat are not good for us. The doctrines of man permit what is not permissible in the forbidden food of Leviticus 11. So the doctrines of man put a direct challenge to what God has said is not for us to eat. So if you think about this, if God made certain creatures that if man ate them, he would have harm done to him, what does Jesus dying on the cross and taking this away, how does that change it? for us. If it was forbidden for reason at creation, it's forbidden for us now. It's for our benefit. Teachers, Bible teachers, look for validation in the Bible by their own interpretation to eat from the forbidden tree. Like I said in the verse before, is they, they were not willing to listen to instructions. They were not willing to hear and so this, there's this thing that really, really is the culprit of why people misunderstand scripture, is the misunderstanding 
of the Hebrew scriptures, scriptures from a Greek misperception. So the whole problem was this. We're trying to understand a Hebrew document written by Hebrew people, written in, written in a Hebrew language, written from a Hebrew perspective. We're trying to understand it from not only Greek, but we also try to understand it from American English culture, and that's not going to work, especially when we try to read the letters of Paul. We, we get so confused for two reasons. One, we're not looking at the scriptures through Hebrew eyes, nor are we looking at it through the Hebrew language. The Hebrew language is the key to understand what, what is it that we're learning here from Paul. And the second reason um, would be is that we have not read the Torah and the Tanakh, or the Old Testament, you put them, um, the, the Tanakh is the Old Testament. We haven't read that first before we read the New Testament. So we go off and try to understand the New Testament without first having an understanding of the Old Testament. So um, this forbidden fruit, food that man tends to deny and uh, dismiss because he's made up his own um, he made up his own doctrines, his own theology. Uh, it's not always intentional that he does this, but oftentimes it's because that he didn't understand the scriptures in the right context. When you read scripture, part of the part of the process is understanding what context it was written in. And if you understand what it was written in, the context, kind of like the there's a biblical study rule that says, well, one of them is is to understand a scripture, read 10 verses back and read 10 verses ahead to know what the context is. This is a very basic Bible study method. And it does seem to work. Well, that's about all the time we have for this episode of Reboot the Root in the episode, the first episode of Good for Food. I want to thank you for joining me for this episode and invite you to come back next time for episode two and want to remind you that if you are not currently a subscriber, please hit that subscribe button and feel free to leave a comment at the bottom as long as it's respectful and that you have Bible scriptures to back up your comments. And also, if you like this video, I want you to like it and maybe send me a comment saying what you liked about it. So for now, this is Reboot the Root signing off and saying Shalom.